What's up fellow bookworms and welcome back to the channel. My name is Dylan and I have just finished reading Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Kind of, it's actually been a couple days since I finished it, but I'm recording the video now. This one was by far the chunkiest to date, coming in at over 600 pages, at least in this edition. And it's kind of, you know, I've been eyeing Order of the Phoenix because it is significantly bigger than this one. I think it's just over 800 or so pages. And this one took a little while, not because I didn't enjoy it or anything like that, but just because it is pretty chunky. It's a big book. And part of that is because the very first like 200 pages, like a th almost a third of the book, not really, but it felt like it, probably a fourth of the book, was about the Quidditch World Cup that, you know, I enjoyed. I'm certainly not complaining because it was very entertaining to read about, but I just don't know, other than some some things that happened kind of towards the end, if it really had anything to do with the plot at all. I mean, yes, there were definitely some connections, but I don't know. I don't know if what happened <laughs> in and around the Quidditch World Cup really warranted taking up uh, like a third or like a fourth or a third of the story. I don't know. It works, obviously, but just kind of strange, you know? Kind of, kind of a big subplot, if you will. But we're gonna do this video a little bit differently than we did the other videos in this series. Uh, as you could tell, I've already finished the book here at the beginning of the video, whereas with the other ones, I would tell you I'm about to read the book, then I would kind of vlog my way through reading the book, and then kind of join up with you at the end to do a little recap. Well, I wanted to try something a little bit different. Uh, let me know if this works better or worse than those other previous videos. But instead of doing it the way that we've usually done it, I have obviously already, like I said, finished the book, and I plan to just kind of walk through the plot a little bit. I took notes as I was reading through, and then at the end, I'll share my thoughts, share my impressions of someone who has just read this book for the very first time, which is the point of this series. So let's get right into it with the Quidditch World Cup. Well, actually, even before that. We see the formula here taking place. And again, not a criticism, not a bad thing, but four books in, there's certainly been a formula established. The story begins with Harry Potter at the Dursley's house being miserable. Things are not going well. He just wants to leave. Book one was obviously the exception, but in all the other books, he just wants to go back to Hogwarts and be with his friends. And then something happens where he is whisked away and, you know, the real story kind of begins. And then the story ends. I'm using a different hand so you can tell this is the end. <laughs> the story ends with Harry kind of reluctantly having saved the day, now going back off to stay with the Dursleys, and the cycle has kind of come full circle. It works because, you know, it's a story about a kid going to school. So with that formula in mind, Harry is at the Dursleys, wishing to be anywhere other than there. Specifically, he wishes to be at the Quidditch World Cup. Well, Ron and the rest of the Weasley crew show up and they whisk Harry away to the Quidditch World Cup, which is actually something that was set up at the end-ish of book three. So we kind of saw it coming and we're kind of looking forward to it. So Harry, you know, there's some drama, of course, with the Dursleys, but we'll save all that. He ends up at the Quidditch World Cup with the Weasleys. Uh, Mr. Weasley, I can't actually remember his name off the top of my head, but Ron's father, Mr. Weasley, has managed to secure some very nice tickets, probably prime tickets to the Quidditch World Cup, and he even had a ticket for Harry, and so they bring him along, how kind. So they show up to this campground with all of the other you know, wizarding families that are going to be attending the World Cup. That's actually like the final of the World Cup. We don't get the whole entire bracket. It's just <laughs> just one match of Quidditch. So the World Cup happens. Harry, Ron, and um, I think Hermione is even there as well, are all up in the box enjoying their prime seats when they notice a house elf in front of them. And I also can't, I'm kind of bad at names. I don't remember the house elf's name. But it was, I believe Mr. Crouch's house elf is sitting in front of them and they kind of strike up, strike up a conversation and it turns out this house elf also knows Dobby, which is kind of a cool little connection there. And then right after that, the Malfoys show up and sit directly behind Harry and Ron and Hermione and presumably the rest of the Weasleys as well. 
So the whole crew is here, more or less. We watch the Quidditch match. It's thrilling. It's exciting. Lots of really cool things going on. And then it's over. Harry and the rest of the Weasleys go back to their tent. They turn in for the night when Harry is awoken with a crazy crowd of people stampeding through the campground. Our crew is assembled, Harry, Ron, and Hermione, and they rush out into the woods, running away from this massive crowd that is just wreaking havoc across this campground. And then we see something crazy. We see the dark mark go up into the sky, and we don't exactly know what it is until all the adults show up, and they circle our crew, and they kind of, I guess for a split second, think that they were the ones to send up the dark mark. Well, obviously, that was not the case. Drama, drama, drama and uh, we flash forward a little bit. At least we flash forward in my mind. There's probably something else going on there, but uh, I don't actually remember. So now we're at Hogwarts. The school year has started, and we're told that this is going to be a special year at Hogwarts. We're not exactly told why, but we find out pretty soon on that the Tri-Wizard Tournament is happening this year at Hogwarts, which means two other schools are going to come to Hogwarts. Hogwarts is hosting, and there's going to be a pretty intense tournament going on. But the catch is only wizards 17 and older can be entered into this tournament, wherein if you win, you get a lot of money and also, of course, bragging rights and a bit of fame. Well, obviously, this doesn't feel like a spoiler. Uh, Harry Potter is somehow mysteriously entered into the tournament, even though he is only... I think 14 at the time or something like that. He's obviously not 17, not old enough to enter himself. So someone entered him into the tournament. And Ron gets a little bit jealous. They don't talk for like a third of the book. Hermione is supportive, she believes him. But pretty much Ron and everyone else in the school thinks that Harry is just up to his old shenanigans. He wants more fame. He apparently needs some cash. He entered himself somehow into this tournament. And that kind of brings up another point that I wanna make real quick. So not only do we have the formula in all books, but we also have something else that has persisted through all four books that I assume is going to persi persist through all seven. And that is how easily people forget who Harry Potter is and like how he is up to this point saved the day like three times, you know? So the whole school basically turns on Harry. They think, oh, oh Harry, he entered himself into this tournament. Even though he keeps saying, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. Why would I do that? I don't want to enter, blah, blah, blah. And the whole school is like, you liar. You obviously entered yourself into the tournament. And then Snape, of course, you know, still is apparently Harry's enemy up to this point. Still thinks he's always up to no good, even though Harry has saved Voldemort from getting the Sorcerer's Stone. He went into the Chamber of Secrets and slayed the big snake, the Basilisk. Uh, book three, I guess, he kind of didn't really save, I mean, as far as anyone else knows, didn't really save the day. But still, you know, what has Harry done up to this point to warrant such, like, why does nobody have faith in Harry? When has he, what has he done wrong? What reason has he given everyone to doubt him all the time? Anyway, it just seems kind of, kind of, I don't know, silly, maybe, like, by now, I feel like he's earned our trust, you know? If he says he didn't do it, he saved, my, he saved my life, you know, a couple times now. He staved off Voldemort for all these 13, 14 years. I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt, you know? Anyway, um, <laughs> nobody believes him, everyone hates him, and now he's gotta to try to prepare basically all by himself for these three very difficult little uh, challenges that consist the tournament. And we're not gonna get into all the details of that. And actually, surprisingly, these events take up like 10% of the book, probably. But anyway, Harry is preparing for these tasks. Ron is ignoring him, he's jealous. Hermione has a crush on the competition, kind of, I guess. I think he mostly has a crush on her. I don't know. Harry's kind of just feeling alone for a lot of the book, which it makes for interesting reading. It's kind of, an, you know, we don't often see the hero without his companions in this series. Oh yeah, we also get introduced to a brand new professor, of course, the new professor for the dark arts, who is Mad-Eye Moody, who was very likable, probably my favorite character in the story. 
Obviously, I'm not going to spoil the ending, but there, he's very involved in the plot, even though he's, again, not featured super prominently throughout the story. But he gets Harry out of trouble on several different occasions. He's someone that Harry feels like he can confide in. He gives him advice, that kind of thing. Just, again, generally being a very likable character. But anyway, drama, 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 subplot, 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 uh, challenges, challenges. And then we get to the final challenge at the end. So I basically set up like the first 20% of the book. We're just going to skip the 40, 60% in the middle. And we're just going to now talk about the last 20-ish percent. And I'm not going to, I mean, you know, the big challenge of this series is how much can I say without warning you about spoilers? This book is like 20 years old. Everybody and their brother has seen the movies and if not read the book. So I feel like I have a license to talk pretty freely about the story. But if it's something crazy, like I'm not going to tell you everything about the ending. And if I do, I'll definitely tell you it is a spoiler. But uh, yeah, so let's talk about the ending. We are in the last event in the tournament. Harry is like tied for second, I think. Uh, he's doing well. He has a clear shot to win. And the last tournament is this maze that all the contestants have to go through. And, you know, of course, Harry is our main character. There are three more books after this one, so you can rest assured he doesn't die or anything like that. Um, and he is actually making pretty good progress. He's like, whoa, this is actually kind of easy. What's up? What's going on here? So he makes his way through this maze and he gets to the end where at the end of this maze is the cup, is the, you know, the trophy. So he sees it, but at the same time, his fellow Hogwarts competitor, the legitimate Hogwarts competitor in the eyes of the school, is also right there, right at the end. And Harry, of course, proves his nobility and his goodness and his pureness of heart. And he says to Cedric, You know what? Uh, you go for it, man. You are the legitimate contender. You helped me out. I'm willing to yield. You take the trophy. Cedric's like, What? No way. We're both here. You take it. And then Harry's like, No way. Let's just do it together. Uh, paraphrasing, of course. So they both grasp the cup together. Major Hunger Game vibes. You remember when they both were going to take the berries at the same time to kind of like, you know, just throw the rules of the competition back at their uh, malevolent overlords? Same kind of deal here. They're going to just win together, which obviously is against the rules, kind of. So they both touch the trophy at the same time and somewhat, spoiler, I guess, are transported to a cemetery where Tom Riddle is there. Well, his grave is there. He's not actually there. He's dead. His grave is there. And Harry's like, what's going on? Where are we? What happened? Did we win? All these questions. And then... I mean, this is where we get to, like, major end-of-the-book spoilers. So if you don't want to hear anything else about this, you can just skip ahead to... I'll put I'll put a time on the screen so you'll know where to skip if you don't want to hear, like, end-of-the-book details. But assuming that you do, uh, we get there. And uh, Peter Pettigrew is <laughs> wheeling in Voldemort. I always imagine... I don't know why. I always imagine, like, a grown man pushing around, like, a a baby carriage where Voldemort is just like a head in the carriage. <laughs> so that's what happens. Peter Pettigrew shows up and he's strolling in with Voldemort in his super weak form. And, you know, there's like the villain speech. Haha, <laughs> come back. I'm gonna exact revenge. Blah, blah, blah. And something happens. You know, a spell happens. <laughs> and Voldemort becomes a man again. Becomes his full form again. Still weak, presumably, but in his full form now. He's no longer the head in the carriage. And there's a battle, uh, you know, Avracadavra, that kind of thing. And uh, the bolts are, you know, doing the thing where they're like head on and they go back and forth and it's a big fight. And somehow Harry, you know, who is like a 14 year old kid is taking on single-handedly the Dark Lord himself, this super powerful wizard who has, you know, godlike abilities. Harry, boom, fighting them single-handedly. All the while, like 12 other super powerful uh, Death Eaters, Dark Lord disciples, are in a circle watching all this happen. Voldemort's like, don't do anything, I'll finish him off. And then, of course, he, you know, three more books. He doesn't, he doesn't finish him off. And they're just standing there like, what do we do? And he's like, don't do anything. Yeah, I get it, you know, you gotta... Three more books are coming down the pike. You know, we can't kill Harry just yet. So miraculously, seemingly, Harry is able to stave off Voldemort. It doesn't kill him, of course, because 
three more books, but he weakens them enough uh, where he can escape. And not only does Harry escape, but he also has the time somehow to pick up the body of Cedric Diggory. Spoiler alert, he died. Yeah, I'm sorry. You probably knew that already. But he died, so he picks up his body, and he runs back carrying his older companion, who is at least 17, you know, our 13-year-old is carrying. Anyway, we don't need to get into the details, okay? He's carrying the body of someone much larger than him, all while, like, at least 12 Death Eaters are standing around. And he grabs the thing, the cup, and they're transported back to Hogwarts. I mean, we can at least do those three other books now. Does it make sense? I don't know. Is it believable? I don't know. But it happens. That's how, basically, this story ends. There's some more stuff with other characters involved. The wrapping up of subplots, which reminds me, the third little thing that I wanted to mention about formula. And again, these are all mostly good things. Um, you know, it works very well. I like how there is always a chapter at the end where all of the loose ends are very explicitly tied. You know, everything is wrapped up. Everything has a conclusion for the most part. There's obviously like the Voldemort stuff that carries over from book to book. But like all the subplots, all the new characters that have been introduced all have a very satisfying end. <laughs> There's no questions. Everything is explained very well, which is great for someone kind of dumb like me. You know, everything is spelled out. Well, remember when this happened? This is why he did that. You know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Where it's just, it's a nice easy read. And if you miss something, you know, they explain it pretty well at the end. So you're not really lost. But that is the gist of the story. Hopefully that made a little bit of sense, at least. <laughs> With that very poor retelling kind of recap out of the way, what did I think of the book? Um, I loved it a lot. Like, probably more than Prisoner of Azkaban. I... It's probably just the fact that it's the most recent one I read. You know, that time is always a big factor in choosing a favorite. Like, obviously, the more recent read is going to probably be fresher in my mind and rank more highly than the book I read last year kind of thing. So I did only read Prisoner of Azkaban a couple weeks ago, but this is probably my favorite so far. I loved the kind of, like, I mean... I'm not gonna say it's like the Hunger Games, but as I was reading through this, I was like, man, this feels very Hunger Games-esque. Not only was there the berries thing, you know, let's just take them at the same time, and also like the competition aspect, which was very unique to this book. It almost felt like same characters, same world, but just kind of very different, the competition aspect. which is very enjoyable. Very easy to just get sucked into. And again, you know, even though I know <laughs> that uh, there's three more books after this and I know like Harry Potter lives, it's amazing how like nervous I was <laughs> for Harry Potter going into these challenges, you know, like how my brain just totally forgot he lives, you know, it's three more books. <laughs> and I was like, man, Harry, come on, get it together, Harry. Come on, hold your breath just a little bit longer. Get past that dragon just a little bit faster. It, yeah, it just really sucked me in and was very, very enjoyable. And I really love that a new character, well, several characters usually, but uh, a new like main character is introduced in each book, specifically the uh, Professor of Dark Arts. I like how every year there's a new teacher. I think Moody carries over. I don't know for sure, though of course, because I haven't read the next book, but I think he carries over into the next book, so I'm interested to see if that's going to be the case in book five, but it's been really fun to kind of get this new character that no one is familiar with and see kind of their backstory and how they connect to the main plot of the story. It's just been a lot of fun getting to know a new character each time, and then another thing, just generally, not about Goblet of Fire, but just in general that I really find impressive about this series is, like, there are a lot of characters in this story. And I think we've all read a book with a lot of characters where we're just like, who is this person? Like, 
this is so-and-so's second cousin twice removed from France who, you know, blah, 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 where we're like, who, why should I care about your second cousin kind of thing? Well, Harry Potter has a ton of characters, yet it never feels like I have to stop and be like, who is this person? How are they connected? I don't know how J.K. Rowling does it, but all this entire cast of characters always feels very fresh, very you know easy to recall who they are and their significance to the story. And it's just, it makes reading the series so much easier and so much more enjoyable. But all that to say, this was, I mean, I think I said that as Prisoner of Azkaban was a five star 10 out of 10 read. So if that is the case, then I have to say Goblet of Fire is five and a half stars out of five and is a 12 out of 10 on the scale. I'm very nervous that Order of the Phoenix is not going to live up to book five. Mostly because it's so big, I just worry that it's going to have, like, big book syndrome and just be, like, too much, you know, that we're going to move away from the concise, easy story and get into, you know, I'm afraid that there's going to be, like, two or three Quidditch World Cups in this book, you know? Like, two or three just big sections that don't have anything to really do with anything, but we'll see. We shall see. I also didn't watch the movie yet of Goblet of Fire, so I'm going to do that, and I'll probably talk about it in the very next video. But anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.